he is speaking. Ahem. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker, registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed, attracted, monitored, and virtual trading accounts, virtual account prices, and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither Phil Stockworld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective offices, personnel, representative agents, or independent contractors, when such classes, licensed financial advisors, raised to investment advisors, or raised to appeals, nothing in this webinar, website, promotional material, hostage, promotion, recommendations, full station, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website, www.optionsclearings.com, to read the characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education, training services, and immense teaching, risks, and potential rewards of trading options. And we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and the results of this webinar are not to be alone, only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary by access to the webinar. You agree with all the people upon the screen, loss you may occur. As a result of the information discussed in the media identified above by access and webinar, you agree to be placed on our main list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and will not distribute to sell your information to anyone. All right, we got past that. Now, let's see. What is going on today? Uh, already, Sri has a question. That is fast, Sri. Um, Sri says, idiot request of the week. Please, can you review Ford in LTP for a new position? It seems to be cheap, and we can get the dividend if we buy before the 23rd. Well, that's a good reason to buy it, and I did want to, I did intend to get more. Um, we got a little aggressive last time. So I guess let's let's do an official, well, uh, how do I want to do this? I don't like making a long, the only thing is I don't like doing a change to long-term portfolio until we do the review, but uh, what's Ford doing at the moment? Where's my little, that, yes. Ford. <laughs> I don't feel like we're in a hurry. Um, mm, mm, mm. See, the thing is, <laughs> yeah, that was me reading. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, remember the Center Express commercial? They used to try to do that. I was getting pretty good at it. <laughs> They had these Federal Express commercials with a really fast talking guy, and I thought that was pretty cool back in the days. I used to try saying things really fast. Um, by the way, it makes it a lot easier though when it's written specifically to talk fast. That book wasn't that the thing they the Fed, I realized in the FedEx commercial, the actual um, the thing the guy was doing didn't have any trips in it. There are things that make your tongue trip or, or tie you up or make you pause, and you know, when you're reading normally. And um, that's part of the part of the reason the guy was able to do it so fast was because there's not he was all very flowy for for speaking. So it's funny you don't realize a lot of things are easy, or a lot of things are designed to be easy. Kind of like uh, the way <laughs> the way the financial system is designed to make rich people richer. It's just it seems natural, but it's not. It's just like it's 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 really actually laid out a certain way to give certain people massive advantages. Um, the tax code, for instance, massive advantages that you get. Um, <laughs> so that, that's a good segue into reality. Is because you know it's funny because you realize the tax code. I forgot what we were talking about the other day. Oh, real estate. Yeah, because <clears throat> if if I form a real estate group, right? Like I put no money into a real estate group, or so just a little bit of money into a real estate group, and we buy a building. So okay, let's put it this way. I organize an LLC, okay? And as the organizer, I have a 10% share of the LLC, even though I don't have any money. Maybe, I, let's say I put in a million dollars, but everybody else puts in $10 million. They put in $90 million, and I put in $1 million. And so they, so they put in 90 times more money than me in this billion dollar building, right? But we all have a 10% interest because I'm the organizer. Why am I the organizer? Because my name is Donald Trump or Eric Trump or, or other Donald Trump or whatever, you know? It's like, because I've got a name and my name carries some weight because I have wealth and whatever or perceived wealth. It doesn't have to be real wealth. But I'm the guy that can put it together. Also, by the way, I can get this done because my dad owns a building or my dad's a builder 
or my dad's friendly with a banker, or my daddy's a banker. There's a million reasons why you are so privileged that you are the guy who gets to put the LLC together and other people just invest in your LLC because they, they your family name carries weight. So meanwhile, so if the building does well, I win because I, I, I make money along with the investors and we all make money, but I'm making a, a massive leverage amount of money compared to what the investors make. But interestingly enough, if the building does poorly, and don't forget, I can start these funds. I now see I put in one million, they put in a hundred million by comparison, right? I can have ten, so my ten million can buy me ten hundred million dollar LLCs with buildings. And what happens if one of my buildings loses money? If the building loses a hundred million dollars, I get a ten million dollar tax write off on my one million dollar investment. That's how the tax code works. It's on, I'm a 10% part of the LLC. So even though I didn't put in, I only put in a million dollars, but I get to write off $10 million on a loss. Isn't that cute? <laughs> so when a building goes bad, it doesn't, not only does it not hurt you, this is where Donald Trump became super duper wealthy. Not only doesn't it hurt you, but it actually gives you a tax deduction on the money you do make on other buildings completely outsized to what it should be because now you you know how it, there's no logic to it how do you write off 10 a 10 million dollar loss when you only put in a million dollars but you get to write that loss off against other buildings that you happen to make they make money on so the tax code is designed and it's not like it's not even an accident it's that there are there are lobbyists whose job it is to put these loopholes in specifically to benefit people like Donald Trump. He pays, he or his dad or whoever, they pay lobbyists to get in there and say, this needs to be in the code. It's very important because look at the risk we're taking and blah, 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 and bullshit, bullshit. You know, it's all like that. And, and, and that's why the tax code is 10,000 pages when really it should be, when you make this much money, you pay this much tax. Everything else is, is lobbying. Everything else is exemptions. Exempt. I, I, you know, you say, oh, yeah, well, a poor person should be exempt. Okay, some simple exemptions make sense. Like if you don't, if you, if you make less, and that's should be in the tax code anyway. If you make less than $25,000, we don't want your money. You're the person we should be helping. <laughs> it's not complicated, is it? There, there are people who have money. The purpose of taxes is to redistribute the wealth. If you don't have wealth, and you're the ones being redistributed too. Now, and then the funny thing is the Republicans love to say, oh, but the poor people pay no taxes and blah, 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 and this and that. And it's like, and because, and because there's, there's 200 million poor people making $25,000, that's like, I don't even know. <laughs> Sorry, brain's dead. Uh... I want to say the wrong number. Makes the whole point invalid if I can't get the math right. All right, so we have 200 million people making $25,000. Yeah, that's $5 billion. So they make $5 billion as a group. And they pay no taxes. And you've heard this argument from the Republicans, right? Look at all these people who don't pay taxes. Meanwhile, Jeff Bezos made $50 billion this year. One fucking guy. <laughs> so the point of taxes is to say to Jeff Bezos, hmm, if we, nothing personal, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I did that wrong. It's fine. It's not. It's $50 billion. Sorry. It's $50 billion. Sorry. See, I did it wrong anyway. It's 200 million people. Oh, it's way more. I knew that number didn't seem right. 200 million people times 25, one, two, three. That's why I wanted to think. Five trillion, sorry, it's five trillion dollars. So it's not nothing, it's not a small amount. It's five trillion dollars, but those people don't pay taxes. The $20 trillion economy. So you've got these people who don't pay taxes effectively. They don't have any money to pay taxes with though. It's the other 100 million people who make also $5 trillion. They need to pay their taxes. It doesn't make sense to ask the people who need help to pay taxes.
And, and, and so the, that's the whole point of it is to redistribute the, the money fairly to address the unequal distribution of wealth. And, and, and you can say, oh, I, I earned that wealth. That's true. You did earn that wealth. But you earn that. That's, that's what that's the that's then, then you start taking apart the argument. That's what they do. They chip away at the argument to say we're not privileged. It is. It's all privilege, though. And you have to recognize it in people, you know, you have to recognize in yourself that you're, 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 you live through privilege, that you had advantages. Um, I was talking to a friend who's a professor of psychology at, um, at uh, Penn, and uh, we were talking to uh, another friend of mine, there were two, four of us from high school got together in the city, we had to dinner. And so, you know, we're really old friends, and we, we talked, we had a very serious conversation about race and relations and so on and so forth. And, and what we've seen over the course of our lives is very, very good. Actually, it was a good thing. We should have recorded for a documentary. But what we were talking about was, at one point, we were talking about the fairness of the system. And, we, and I was saying, I said, look, you know, my parents came to this country, with, they immigrated to this country from England with nothing, they, they didn't have, they didn't really have money or anything like that. Um, they, but my father was educated in college because he came from a country that educated its people. Um, and he got a good job right away. And I went to school and I was smart and I did well and so on and so forth. So, so you know, but I had no barriers stopping me at all. And, and that's why I was born in 1963. Meanwhile, a black person born here in 1963, <clears throat> it was far less likely that he went to a good school and lived in a good neighborhood. It was far less likely that his parents had money to put him to college. It was far less likely that his father had a good job. It was, in fact, 25% chance his father was in jail. And, and, when, and when his father went to get a job, he had a much less chance of getting a high paying job than my father did. And that, it's just a fact. So I could say, oh, I wasn't privileged and bullshit like that. But it's not true. We're all privileged. Anybody who's white and male in America is privileged and has benefited from that privilege. I benefited from going to a school where there wasn't a single black person where, not that that was a benefit, but I'm saying it was just, there were no black people in my school. The first black person I saw in school was junior high school. Um, I, mean, I, lived in, I lived in upper class and in at least middle class neighborhoods pretty much all the way through. So I mean, and, and black people didn't live in middle class neighborhoods when I was a kid. And how could you say that's fair? How could it be fair? It can't be fair. It could not possibly have been fair. And, that, and so when you say, oh, they have equal rights now, and oh, it's, and the system has been fixed and we did all this stuff. It's like, no, there's no such thing as, ha you can't possibly have done enough when I'm, when me in my own lifetime had a huge advantage and therefore my children have a huge advantage compared to that guy's children. It takes a hundred years to fix this stuff, not 20 or 30 years. So, you know, we're, we're all people of privilege, but, but what's, and that's on the base level, but my point is that you have to understand what's going on at the top of this country, because the, we're nothing. As successful as we all are, we're nothing compared to these people who make a billion dollars in a single year. Who Jeff, I mean, Jeff Bezos is now has $175 billion. This is one human being has $175 billion. That's... Um, Wait, <laughs> it's 175,000 millionaires worth of money. 175,000 millionaires worth of money Jeff Bezos has by himself. And where did that money come from? It came from other people. It came from money that didn't go to other people who worked very hard and struggled and whatever. And again, not that Jeff Bezos doesn't deserve to be very wealthy, a great idea, a good company, doing all the right stuff, whatever. But at a certain point, if you're not going to redistribute the wealth, then Jeff Bezos's children are going to own your children. You put, you know, 
Watch. I'm going to pay analogy to regular stuff in a minute, but this is just something I really feel I want to get off my chest. So, uh, compound rate calculator. Let's see. Compound rate calculator. Okay. That's a good one. Money channel. All right. So, you take Jeff Bezos' 175 billion dollars. It, it can't even, you can't even do it. It would break the calculator. Don't, don't put any more money in. Give it, give it, all right, let's say 40 years. He's, he's like, he's got to be about 50, 60 now. So give it 40 years and he'll die and he'll give it to his children. And let's say it only makes, uh, eight, let's say it makes a normal 8% the market makes a year and we compound it once a year. That's going to be $3.8 trillion. Okay. So now we take $3.8 trillion. I'm going to do that. Delete that. Yeah. No, 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 no. Let's call this, let's try to remember now. This is $3.8 trillion. Now that's 40 years from now. So that's 2000. Um, da, 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 what do we mean? 12, 20, 20. So let's say 2060. Now, all right, that's good. So now, now that now that's Jeff Bezos's kid in 2060 gets 3.8 trillion dollars, and if there's no inheritance tax, they get all of it. So 40. Now that's an eight percent. Amazon grows a hell of a lot faster than eight percent a year. But let's just keep it in line. So, <laughs> so now Jeff Bezos's kid, starting in 2040, is sitting there with 3.8 trillion dollars. Doesn't pay inheritance tax. And uh, he now puts it, and he just keeps it in the market for another 40 years. We still grow at 8%, and he gets $82 trillion. $82 trillion is all the money in the world. Now, sure, there'll be inflation and so on and so forth, so the world will have more money, but $82 trillion is a lot of money. Okay. If you let wealth grow unchecked and untaxed and uninheritance taxed, then a very, very small amount of people will own the planet Earth. That's how it works. We, we, are, we are in the, the very early stages of a really tragic mistake. And it all starts with these attitudes that we have about like who deserves what and so on and so forth. Because, you know, look, that's the game. People, and that not Jeff Bezos in particular, but uh, you know the 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 Koch, the Koch brothers and um, and Trump and whoever and his pals. You know, there are there are people who are incredibly wealthy who feel that you shouldn't get anything. That nobody, you know, that they should keep everything they get. And that attitude is becoming the law. And if that becomes a law, we're doomed. So just food for thought. <laughs> okay. Just food for thought. I mean, so in other words, you know, and like I said, it's just the way that we are, we have these advantages. Of, we've had these advantages over the course of our lives that have, that have given us legs up in, in life. These guys are born with, not with silver spoons, not with golden spoons. They're built, they're built with platinum, titanium, whatever the frick kind of spoons in their mouths. That there's no stopping this. It's like a snowball to hell. And that's what was wrong with the world. Uh, you know, 500 years ago, what was wrong with the world is all the money was owned by the kings and queens. All of it. They had essentially all the wealth and everybody else, else was a peasant. That's what we're moving back to, feudalism. So anyway... All right, so that's enough of that. But that's what that's what's pissing me off today. I'm just very unhappy with the way things are going. I really don't like. I, it's especially scary to see these laws coming about, and God knows what's going to happen in the election. I'll be very pissed off. Give me, give me two more weeks. I'll be very, very, very pissed off. In fact, I'm taking this trip. I'm so I'm leaving the country. I do that. It's funny. I do that. I tend to do that around election time. Actually, it's because of my mother's birthday, so I tend to do, I tend to take a boat trip with my mom on her birthday. Um, so this week, November 4th to 10th, I'm going to be taking a trip. I will be out of the country on a boat, but I'll still be working, of course, because I always work. Anyway, where are we? All right, so what are we talking about? 
<laughs> oh yeah, Ford. So we're going to talk about Ford. All right. So do I see an urgency to do anything about Ford? No, I don't, because Ford is in the dumpster and it's still in the dumpster. And even today on a big update, it's still in the dumpster. So I wouldn't, I'm not running into it. Okay. So when we do the review, I will do a Ford trade. What do we have in the long-term portfolio in Ford? We have portfolio, wrong button, portfolio. long-term portfolio and let's see if we can find Ford oh yeah see last week we, we brought back the short calls because we thought it was really bottomy then and I guess we weren't actually correct it was down here so I guess you know so that that was um, not last week but when we when we closed that and when we did the last rollover we brought back the short calls anyway, so uh, hasn't really helped much, but we brought back those. So the next step is to uh, double down on the position. But, <clears throat> you know, look, realistically, if I double down 1045 to 878, it's um, 1045 plus 878 divided by 2 is 961. It only drops my average to 961. It's not really that exciting. So I want to see something more interesting than that. I, I understand you like, oh, you get the dividend, but what's the dividend? Like 10 cents or five cents or something? Um, it's, it's really not the way I'd let my actions be dictated. But yes, I do want to add more forward. I'm just not sure that this is the lowest it's going to be. And it really doesn't make me that in 60 cents. All right, well, you get 15 cents. So I understand what you're saying. saying. Well, if we do it now, we get 15 more cents. And yeah, that's not nothing. You know, you're gonna get a 15 cent dividend, but I also can just keep. I get a 15 cent dividend off of 878, or or I could keep the 878 and have um, I don't know what, like 650 times 15 cents, right? So so this is 50. So I need 50 15s to get one back. That it's not like it's not that thrilling. Um, so I, 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 you know, I understand conceptually why you want to do it, and, and and the logic is there. But I don't know that this is a bottom for Ford, and I would rather be sure that it's a bottom before I jump in. Um, I, I'm gonna tell you actually, at, at 8:45, knowing that I can drop my basis a whole buck, I'm a, I'm a little more excited to buy it. But it's at, at, at 8:78. It's not that just to just to make the dividend. Now, of course, you could say, well, okay, well, if it's 845 plus 15, if it's 855, then, and I'm capturing the dividend, maybe that makes sense. But then I'd have to go look and see what I'm getting paid for the options. And we talked about that when we made the changes to Ford. So okay, it's 880 at the moment, and I can sell the sevens for 220. So that would net me in for now. See that that gets a little more interesting because I only have to sell half. <clears throat> in other words, the ones we have now are uncovered. So all I have to do is is is, is buy more for 880 and sell those, which means which brings down to 660. So now it's 6.6 .6 plus whatever we spent originally. Um, you want to say I'm only going to cover the half that are new. So it's 660 plus um, 10.45 divided by 2. And now we've got our, now we're down to 852 is our average. But half of them will get called away at, at, at what was that number? Ah. Half will get called away at 7. But even if they get called away at seven, that would uh, still that would still knock down my total a bit. It's not so bad. It's a dollar fifty loss. I'd be basically at ten dollars. So lower my basis by fifty cents, even if they do get called away at seven. But most likely we're gonna you know roll them along. Um, you know, and that makes sense because really you're taking you're just taking a six sixty to seven dollar profit. But it's but but you see it's really it's not that attractive that I want to jump all over it. Um, ideally, 
when Ford is either at seven, in which case you're buying it for seven, selling the seven dollar calls for a dollar fifty, let's say, and then you're netting it for five fifty against your ten fifty, and you're dropping your basis down to like eight down to seven uh five fifty plus ten fifty is sixteen, you're dropping your basis down to eight. That's attractive. So that and that and that by the way is what will happen if they if they pull their dividend. Um so that becomes attractive, but there's no strike other than seven or ten. Now, if it goes up to ten, even though we're already in a ten, it then becomes attractive to sell calls, and I would then sell. Well, how much would it be? Let's see. We're in the, we're in between seven and ten right now, so it's going to be between these two prices. It'll be between dollar three and two twenty eight. So call it a buck sixty. Now, if four to ten, and we buy more at ten. But we sell all the covers at a um, dollar sixty. We're effectively buying ten minus three twenty, right? So we're double covering the new batch. Then we're buying it at six eighty on the new batch, plus ten forty on the original three thousand. Is seventeen twenty divided by two is eight sixty. So you see how that's more attractive. It's actually more attractive to wait until Ford goes to ten then buy more, then sell all the covers, and now our average is 860 with a call away at 10 on 6,000 shares. So if Ford does well, we have a very clear plan to get our net down to 850. If Ford does badly, if Ford goes to seven, we would only sell uh, minus 150, we'd only sell one half cover, but then 550 plus 1040 is 1590, divided by two is eight, is also eight. So if Ford does badly, we will drop our net to eight. If Ford does well, we will drop our net to eight. All right, but if we jump in now, we're really not doing any, you know, we're not making enough of a difference. It's not worth, you know, 15 cents isn't worth, you know, jumping in for no reason. So I guess that's the bottom line. I, I, you know, I did I did want to add to the Ford position, but not if it's just drifting along at 850. It's sort of an indecisive point. And there's no eight, if there were eight dollar calls to sell, I'd feel very different. I'd have a better premium, but there's not. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to pass on that. I think. But you know, for FYI, if you were gung ho to do it, those are the ways that you can uh, do it to lower your thing. Eric says, what is your um, view on Ford? I uh, wasn't able to locate it. I know it's, it's very hard to locate. So if, it's, if it's Ford or Macy's or something like that, he, he, the search for one letter is crazy. Um, but I probably haven't even made any major comments on Ford. I'd say mostly what I would have said about Ford is uh, I, I like them as an operation. It's not a bad company. It's not, look, it's one of these things. Not you, not you, not you, not you, not you, not that. There, aha. <laughs> I knew I had somewhere. My Stockopedia. Ford. They're way more accurate than Yahoo as far as numbers. All right. <clears throat> um, but you got to pay for these guys. So, look. Auto sales. These have been good years. They're going to decline. That's fine. But they're still going to make $5 billion a year. That's still a healthy amount of money. They're going to make about 32 a share. And you can buy a share now for eight fifty, or to I'm sorry, whatever the hell the number is. Maybe it is eight fifty. Is it? That's crazy. <laughs> it's weird. I just said say it. I'm like, really? It's like I can't even believe it while it's happening. Um, I mean, the I don't know. What, what do I? What should I say about it? It's a freaking major auto company. They've been around four hundred and something years. They invented the freaking thing. <laughs> they invented the automobile, um, and they're still here. <laughs> um, 
They've got, a, you know, they're not going to go away. They're not going to die. They're, they're, they're a good, productive company making good, solid money. They're not going to make more money every year, though. This is a problem with legacy businesses, the problem with Coca-Cola, this is the problem with Ford, this is the problem with any, any major company, problem with IBM, the problem with GM. They've got a global market share in a business that doesn't change very much over time. So expecting them to double and triple their revenue is ridiculous. They're not going to, and they're not going to, and, and, and inherent in that is they're not going to you know, will Ford have $300 billion in revenue 10 years from now? No. They won't. They're going to have the same freaking share or less or whatever, but they're going to have some share of the auto market, but they're not going to go away and they're not going to take it over because there's plenty of other major players. And, and, and you don't go into the stock with unrealistic expectations of growth, but unfortunately, that's what, that's what traders do. I, I don't know why you would ever think Ford is hot, and I don't know why you would ever think Ford is cold. It's just fucking Ford. It goes, it chugs along, doing what it does. Look at this freaking, uh, look at this thing. 10, 12, 950, 1150, 950 again, 12, 13 almost, back to 10, back to 12. Nobody knows what this thing is worth. But you know what it's worth to me? I give them ten dollars, they give me a dollar thirty. I'm happy with that arrangement. I'll keep that for ten years and make thirty percent over ten years. Plus, I still own the stock anyway. They don't give me a dollar thirty, but that's what the company makes. I own the company. I'm buying the stock. I own a piece of. I own. I own my percentage of that money. Every share gets a dollar thirty back in earnings. And if it goes down to 80 cents and I gave them $10, I'm good with that too. As long as it's 80 cents, as long as it's 8% a year, they're doing you a service. As I should always look at your stocks. Anything that pays you a PE of 15 is just fine. PE of 10, better than fine. Pay you $1.30 on eight bucks, ridiculous. That's all there is to it. It's not complicated. So when the PE is five or five, wait, five times one thirty is five plus one fifty six fifty. Now I'm here with one five six. Let's say six. So the PE is six, six point five probably on the stock. So what do I need to know about them? I need to know that they're not going bankrupt, basically. As long as they're not going bankrupt, I don't give a crap what anyone thinks the price is. Every $6.50 I give them, they give me a dollar back. What do I need to know? Do I think the Focus will do this? Do I think the Mustang will do that? Do I think the truck is this and the aluminum that and the tariff is that? Who cares? They'll figure it out. They figured it out for the last hundred years. They figured it out through the, the Great Depression. They figured it out in World War II. They figured it out through the Vietnam War. They figured it out through World War I. <laughs> Don't forget about World War I was in there too. <laughs> they made it through the Vietnam War, the, the Soviet War. They made it through the energy crisis. Gas was, you know, we got gas spiked up to me. You know, well, it, you know, inflation adjusted levels of, of uh, I mean, I mean, basically, we only earned, I only earned, like, I think minimum wage was like a dollar an hour when gas was over a dollar back in the in the 70s, right? It wasn't minimum wage, like a buck or a buck 60. Gas was, you know, gas was a buck 60. So, therefore, uh, it's equivalent to, like, 15 bucks now, or at least eight bucks now per gallon. So, they, they've been through that. They've been through energy crises. They've been through everything. Some years they make money, some years they don't make money, but you know what? They're going to they're gonna be there. And as long as they're going to be there, I'm going to be very happy to be to own them. You know, some, some stocks you shouldn't overthink it. It's pretty, pretty obvious that you should own them. And I would definitely put forward in that category. All right? But that doesn't mean I shouldn't, you know, I, you know look, they tested 850 and they held it. And if they hold it up for another week or two, it's, it's definitely, you definitely want to say, well, I guess that's the bottom. I guess I better buy something to buy another 3,000 shares. Now's the time. Doesn't mean we're going to sell calls against it, though. We might buy 3,000 shares and wait.
but it depends on the market because if the market's collapsing, which it doesn't look like it is as of today, but if the market's completely collapsing, then sure, it's going to go down. It'll go down with everything else for no good reason. Just like every, just like everything went down in 2008 for no good reason. You know, the financial crisis didn't didn't stop. You know, I mean, look, people stopped. It stopped things from happening. People didn't buy new cars for a while. The, the car industry suffered. Um, but you know, like there were food companies to buy things like that. There, you know, people still bought light bulbs to put on it to put in their house. There are certain things you'll say, okay, this is kind of recession proof. Ford's not one of them, but I'm saying there are things that are recession proof. But everything got up, went on sale in 2008. And you just got to be smart. You got to say, well, what what really you know what shouldn't be hit as much as this is being hit. All right. Soma says, BJO, any opinion on how quickly this has moved up? If I look at the two-year chart, we're not far from the $50 top. Well, you know, well, okay, BJO is a, uh, not really what you want to be looking at. BJO is simply a reflection of the price of coffee. And uh, we're back to, um, see, that it doesn't even have a long history. It's a, it's a short, it's, I don't know you look at two years. I don't know, does CTF even go back two years? But um, anyway, so, so we, we're back to whatever. But the point of BJO is it's a reflection of the price of coffee. And coffee is, if I can find my futures, here they are. Coffee, 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 months. So you're saying, if I look at the two-year chart, we're not top from $50 set back in January. So let's try to look at the two-year chart. Here's the two-year chart, and we're not far from whatever on BGO. Yeah, that's right. We're not far from here, are we? But you know what this is in, in freaking coffee? Another $20 move. We've been sitting here this whole time just for a $20 move. The bigger picture shows you the variance in coffee. Now, you look at oil. And you say, well, we're probably not going to go back to 100, but we went to the bottom, and we're all the way back here now. And if you look at natural gas, we were up here at 5, we went down to 2, and now we're at 350, or almost at 350. So you're looking at, well, let's, let's look at other stuff. Let's look at gold. I mean, you know, I'm just showing you commodities. You have to understand commodities. We went from 1,600 to 1,100, back to 14. Now we're back to 1,220. Well, that one's got plenty of room to go, too. Um, indices. Well, that's not going to be a good example. <laughs> you can't tell an indice from two-year charts. Those are just crazy up. Anyway, um, coffee. Oh, here's lumber. Lumber's in the tanker. Lumber went way down. It's coming back. See, lumber's going to be a buy soon. Because you get to a certain point, it's just too low, and then it's going to come back. But you're, you're saying, uh, let's get out because all the money's been made. I, I don't think so. Uh, I, think, I think coffee should be at least above 140. I think this is silly. I think this has been... look. We had some good crops. This was an overthink. This this was caused by carrot. All right, all the all the K cuts. Remember the, the the crazy thing. What happens? Coffee was down, 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 down. Whatever. Then then um, we got the you know at the same time you got the explosions of Starbucks and everybody else. But what really happened was coffee pods. And the thing about coffee pods is um, it's a demand for coffee to fill up warehouses and fill up shelves with coffee. Okay, there were places where there were no uh, coffee cups. Like, think of, um, 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 uh, where's that place my kids go? A Coles. Is it Coles? I don't know. I think it's Coles. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's Coles, Target, and Beth and Beyond. Okay, I mean, I, yeah, several places I can think of that we've gone to where there are entire shelves now filled with, with, K-cups and whatever. It's like the pre-made coffee packs, right? They didn't used to have, they still have shelves filled with a can of coffee, although not, not as in, in vogue anymore. The grocery store still has their bags of coffee, but they also have shelves filled with all these little stupid cartridges to make coffee in. 
and all the hotels. I was just in a, I was just in the high of New York, and they had a rack, like a spinny rack, with like every possible kind of coffee and a coffee machine in my room. Now you think about that because they didn't used to have that either. They used to have a little packet, you know, a fancy hotel would have a packet of coffee for a machine. They wouldn't have like every kind of coffee. So my room had a pound of coffee in it at least in my hotel. The grocery shelves have pounds and pounds and pounds of coffee, hundreds of pounds of coffee. In the back, they've got thousands of pounds of coffee in the in boxes, right? And now every Costco's got them, every warehouse place has them, every um in the supermarket, Bed Bath & Beyond, like I said, you go in there and the first thing you see when you walk in Bed Bath & Beyond is all the coffee crap they got. Um, that's where this demand spike came from, was warehousing a massive amount of coffee. It's not real demand, though. That's the problem. That's why it went right back down. They warehouse all this coffee in all these various ways, and also there was also an uptick in more Starbucks. Every time you have a Starbucks, thousands of pounds of coffee, right? Every time you open a new store, thousands of pounds of coffee. And Starbucks then opens up, Starbucks then builds their own warehouse distribution centers with thousands and thousands of pounds of coffee sitting around that didn't never used to be sitting around. It used to go straight from the grower to the grocery store to your cup. There were no in-betweens. There were no shops giving you coffee. You know, other than, you know, you go to the diner and get a cup of coffee. All this stuff was new. So they took a lot of coffee off the market or pulled it through the market into different places where it stalled. That's what caused the big price spike. And at the time, we were shorting it because I said that at the time. It was like, it was silly. Uh, but then it went down, and now you, have, now you have to play the demand game. It's like, where is the real demand for this stuff? How much has all these K-cups and all these uh, coffee shops and whatever added to actual demand? And that's what you got to figure out is where's the right number. Now, certainly it was above 120. I've been maintaining that forever. It's certainly above 120. It's probably 140-ish. I'd say it's probably 140, 160 band. It's more like the real demand for coffee. But the bottom line is this is way too low, and we're still way too low. This was ridiculous. That's why I've been banging the table on it. That was stupid. Now we're back to where we, where we generally were taking the bets. For the last couple of years, we've been betting off of this line. And we've been taking the money and running on these tiny little moves up like a Nicholas finding coffee. It's a lot of money. But as long as they hold the 120 line, I'm still bullish on coffee. And I expect it to hit 140 at some point. And meanwhile, any kind of weather disruption, which we haven't had, we've had really blessed uh, production weather for coffee for many years now. Um, any kind of major uh, of, of blight, what they call a blight in coffee, of a... They have these little viruses and these bugs that attack the coffee crops, and there's something called rust that attacks the coffee crops, uh, and a shift in temperatures, a drought, either too much rain, too little rain. Coffee is very sensitive. There's a lot of ways coffee can get disrupted, and that can cause it to really spike up. So I want to be there for that. But, you know, so you can't go by what, what BGO does. doesn't matter. What matters is what coffee is actually doing, what the actual product coffee is doing. And it's got legs. And we do have a BJO position in the um, short-term port now in the in the options opportunity portfolio. We still have that. We gave up in the long-term portfolio. It was getting too silly, and I didn't like it. But we left it in the options opportunity portfolio, and I don't even know if it's in the money yet. I, I think barely in the money. Um, yeah, so it's only up about a thousand bucks. But we have the March 38-41 spread. We're deep in the money, so we're going to collect all. We're going to collect what we're owed. We paid. Uh, twenty one hundred dollars for it, and it's a um. Let's see, it's a four uh, three dollars. It's a six thousand dollars spread. So we're gonna make four thousand bucks, and right now we're up about a thousand. So that's fine, you know. But that, that's just what we have left. Um, actually, I mean, if you think about it now, you can still take this spread for sixteen hundred bucks, and it's gonna pay. Well, wait, wait, no, sorry. This spread is net $3,700, and it's going to pay $6,000. Still not bad. So I, I certainly still like it. I wouldn't be throwing it out. The I hope that answered your question. Uh, can we do some futures, Ori says? Yeah, we'll do that after this. Uh, if, if there's any to do. Oh, where's the Fed? We're almost up at the Fed time, too. Phil, uh, Randy says, Phil, with your knowledge, connections, and ability to make money, you have the power to make change. Yes, I try. 
<laughs> Take time away from PSW, find the platform and start yelling. Uh, look at Pete Navarro, Trump advisor from Irvine. People knew him before going to Washington. I've done that. I've actually, I've done the Washington thing. I was, uh, I was lobbying for a while. I was working with a bunch of different causes and I still work behind the scenes. If you go to, um, um, if you go to Tommy Payne, T-H-O-M-M-Y, Payne, P yeah, you know, like Thomas Payne, the philosopher, dot, you know, Thomas Payne on, on Twitter, that's a project I'm working on with a bunch of uh, liberals. Um, you know, I, you know, we try, we do, and we are actually with, with Tommy Payne, we're very, very much in the, uh, we're very connected to a lot of uh, Washington people on that too. And uh, we are trying to get our voice heard. We're trying to put things out. We're trying to help people get elected. You know, that's all you can do. It's, I, I mean, I, you can get there and talk until you're blue in the face, but I'm just going to have to keep plugging away as best I can. And my children, my legacy, thank you. <laughs> anyway, I got, me, I got my kids also. I'm training them to be liberal bastards also. Um, he says, just remind me, Phil, uh, butterfly portfolio model is, yes, I know. We're going to do the whole model. We'll do that. Don't worry. That'll be done in the butterfly review. Um, Soma says, so you need to look at the futures charts. Yeah, because BJ, all BJO is is a, is a ETF that trades the coffee futures for you. That's all. It's it's, it's only going to make money if the futures make money. Um, JC says, would you adjust the March thirty eight forty one spread? Ah, I see. So would I? No, I think it's fine. I mean, it's it's the time frame we expected to make the money. So I don't want to change it. I, I don't know what's going to happen after March. I was very comfortable with my prediction that in March we should be much higher than 41. Um, as, I, as I said, it's currently $3,700. It's going to make $2,300 more. And $2,300 into $3,700 is uh, whatever it is, 23 divided by 37. 62% is going to make 62% between now and March. I, I don't know. I don't know what you people want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, it's only going to make 62% between now and March. we got to change it. I don't know. <laughs> How can we live on 62% in six months? Um, I'm sorry. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a level of risk I'm comfortable with making. I, I don't know. I feel like an idiot excusing myself for making 62%. <laughs> It doesn't seem silly to you. Like, I think the, oh well, I'm only, we're only gonna make sixty-two percent. I guess we can mess around with it and take additional chances and maybe lose money instead of making sixty-two percent. But I'm I'm fine with sixty-two percent. I really am. Anyway, all right, where are we? Um, all right, futures. I did say that I have to look at the futures. So let's look at the futures. Mm -hmm. Boring. Oh, am I so glad we called out of those? Ah, what a call. Got out of, uh, we had our oil long and we had our um, gasoline long and we made about 500 bucks as a pair. So I said that was enough. And I said I was right on the money, wasn't I? Wow. Let's talk about that. So how, how do I do that? <laughs> how do I do that? Um, You know, I wish I could tell you, um, it's like, who was it? Was it Willie Keeler who said, I mean, baseball players, like, Willie Keeler said, yeah, you know, he, they go, well, what do you, you know, what, why do you have such a great average? And he goes, like, you hit him, you hit them where they ain't. He said, I think it was Willie Keeler. I'll be very proud if I got that right. Hit, hit him where they ain't. Who said it? We Willie Keeler. <laughs> I love it when we, I know, I'm just, it's, at this point in my life, when my brain works, I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm like, it's like, yes, yeah, still going. 1890, Willie Keeler. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about him since I was a kid. <laughs> but anyway, so he, his, his philosophy of hitting was hit him where they just, <laughs> like, how, how are you such a good hitter? Well, I hit him where the guy isn't. <laughs> It's not complicated. How do you explain something like that? That's the problem. It's, it's, um, he, he came up with the best one. And my other one is people, you have to watch the whole movie, but people always ask me, like, how do you know when to do this or that? And my answer is, which is hard, I can't give an answer because it's too complicated to explain the answer. But in Roger Rabbit, 
you know, he who killed Roger Rabbit or whatever that movie is called. Um, it's um, the rabbit is in handcuffs, and the guy's dragging the rabbit all over the place, and they're handcuffed together, and it's really inconvenient. It's a pain in the ass, blah 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 blah. And then way later, like uh, like he's been dragging around for for like a half hour's worth of the movie at least. And and after this, and then he gets he finally gets a hacksaw. He starts to saw off the handcuffs, and the rabbit slips right out of the handcuffs. Because he's a cartoon, you know, so he's right out of the handcuffs and he's sitting there and the guy's sawing the handcuff and he realizes the rabbit's like sitting over there watching him saw the handcuffs. He's like, you could have done that anytime. And the rabbit's like, no, not anytime, only when it was funny. Which is, you know, so you have to watch the entire, if you don't watch the whole thing, it makes no sense. But point being, it's hard to say why you do something exactly, you know, when, you, when you've when you got so many factors and so much stuff going on, but there's a certain time that you feel that, you know, there's a bunch of stuff comes together. The news I'm reading, the chart, the way the chart's looking, the action on the chart, the volume, there's a whole bunch of factors that come together. Uh, also, when, when, was, when is the oral report, when was the oral report in this case, when it was, how did it come in? How is that versus expectations? You know, there was a lot to it. So what did I say at the oil report? We had um, at 10.30, oil up 6.5 million barrels, gasoline down 2 million barrels. Um, RB will be oversold, and it's now 1942. And uh, 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 as they had a draw, but the oil bill was likely due to storms and refinery shutdowns. That was my take at 10.30. So then at 11, I said oil may be bottoming at 70. We can play, uh, and where, where's a, oh, here it is. So that, that's that 11. And I said oil may be bottoming at 70. We can play oil long over 70 with tight stops, uh, but really tight stops. And RB at 1925, same thing. B, Brent bounced at 79, so watch that. And the dollar was at 95.11 for references. You know, dollar being 95.11, as the dollar went up, it made oil weaker and it started dropping down. So, so now is actually a good time probably to go along again because the dollar's maxing out here at 95.20 or probably maxing out. Um, and gasoline, and gas, gasoline, which I which you can tell I like that call better because that was what I said before here. I said gasoline is gonna be oversold, and it was in fact oversold at 19250, and we got a very nice pop here. All right, but then here, so basically one o'clock is when they is when they topped out. And then so later I say, when did I give it until? At 12.54, took the money and ran on RB and CL, nice pop, made enough money. You have, to, you have to recognize when you've made enough money in the futures, when you say that's fine. 250 per contract on the, you know, 250 on RB, 250 on CL, it was a combined $500 winner. I was very pleased, and now we're ready for the webinar. So here we are on the webinar, and they're back down to where we entered them. And I'm ready to go long again. Oh, that's selling, so we're gonna go long here. And we're 192.50 again, so we can go long here. And they may go down further. Watch the W, right? Might go down further, gotta be willing to add one. Might go down further, got to be willing to add one, but this is a good uh, representational spot. This is right back where I thought it was a little getting oversold before. So what's changed between now and then? Nothing. What happened was a dollar. See, this is the thing. What's the factor now? All the other factors stayed the same. There hasn't been any major news. Nothing really changed. What's changed is the dollar. The dollar got rammed higher. Get this out of the way. The dollar got ran much higher. That put pressure on oil from this, from from here. You see where where do we start falling apart? This is a 1050. So 1050. You see what happened? The dollar kept going up, and oil went up, but then it succumbs to the pressure here, especially on this last huge spike. We started right here, 1245. Right here, 1245. See what happened? So most of the problem that the dollar and the, the, the oil and gasoline are having right now are because of the dollar. And I think 92, 90, 95.20 is a good move for the dollar. We've, we've broken over the, um, 
the second, the second resistance line, which is rare. That's why there's these lines. They rarely, you rarely go past the second line in a single day move. Although this market's so crazy, it happens all the time. The, what, what rarely happens, happens all the time. But you rarely go past. <clears throat> all right. So any minute the Fed minutes are going to come out and we'll see what happens, especially with the dollar. But if the dollar spikes higher on the Fed minutes, which are, which, what are they going to say? How are they going to surprise us to make the dollar move? They really shouldn't. But if the dollar goes even higher on the Fed minutes because it seems more bearish than people think or whatever, more, more hawkish, um, the, and that pushes oil further down, then I'm happy to double down because it's only because of the dollar. Those are there's a temporary effect. The repricing of a commodity based on the current day's movement of the currency is a temporary effect that has nothing to do with the actual value of the commodity. So over time, even if the dollar just stabilizes, the commodity will tend to find its own, its own value. It's a very short-term effect of movement of currency against a commodity or, or an index. It's a, very, it's a very pronounced effect, but it's a very short-term effect on the whole. So it's interesting because Trump is blaming the Fed for his truck for the for the market's trouble. And if you assume that Trump's people are behind manipulating the market, then it would be in their interest to tank the market after the Fed minutes are released because they want to say, see, it's that freaking Fed that's causing all our trouble. So it'll be very interesting what happens in the next 10, 15 minutes. All right, so back to the indexes. Would I play these indexes? Um, <laughs> oh, wow, I would totally short 1600, but we can get there. Um, Ford. <laughs> Look, we're at four. Um, I guess we talked about that last week. Y M. All right. So yes, I like the Dow short here because 25 eight, 25 eight is a good stop out, and it would cost 40 times five is a uh, 200 dollars. That's not a terrible risk. The S and P below 2815 is not a bad play. Um, the Nasdaq. So that would cost 2815 would cost nothing. We can play that line. The NASDAQ, if it goes up eight points, that's $160. And the Russell, if it goes up nine points, is um, 50, 450. That's too expensive. So the, the least expensive way to play is probably the S is playing the SP right on the 15 line. Um, or whoever's lagging. So I, I guess if the SP breaks down, let's take a look. But let's. But I don't want to play before. I want to see what happens. I and mean, it's a little too risky beforehand. I'm happy with my oil and gasoline longs. We'll see what they do first. Anybody else look interesting? Gold, no. Silver, no. Uh, silver, kind of. You know, I mean, I like silver long, but it's not there. Copper, nah, because copper's got a China issue. Dollar is still going up. All right. So now we'll find out what the Fed does. Fed minutes released and. Oh my God, what do they say? Gradual uh, something balances, risk of going too fast. Oh, they're taking a gradual approach. There's a risk to going too fast or too slow. They need to hike over the long run. Um, oh, come on, Bloomberg, I can be faster than that. Global policy divergent that could lift the dollar poses risks. Notice I'm not, the, I'm not in the mood to read the minutes myself, so I'm just being lazy and looking at the news. I mean, and again, I don't, I don't expect there to be anything exciting in it. We've already discussed all this stuff to death. And the Fed has certainly made it very clear, and Powell made it very, very clear what he sees. And Trump has made it very clear that he disagrees. I think this is, I think this is perfectly sensible that you do. No, that's it. The, so the, the, the key to it is there's a gra they're doing a gradual approach. There are people who are worried about going too fast. There are people who, who think they're going too slow. Um, but generally, they know they need to hike rates over the long term. But they're not really clear on how long the long term is. So there's nothing in there that's particularly bullish. And I would definitely short right now. And the short's going to be the S&P. So let's go over there. And we're going to trade ES. ES, ES, ES. 
If you, only because the S&P has the best stop line. The S&P has the cheapest stop line before we can get out. So we'll sell one real quick just to get in it. So my stop is 15. Up here is a stop, so I can't lose that much. But hopefully we'll have a sell-off that takes us back down to test 28. And how, now, how much do I expect to lose at 15? If it goes like 15.50, we're at um, 13.50. So let's say we lose two, and that's going to be 100 bucks basically on the S&P. It's $50 a point. If, on the other hand, we go down to here, we're going to make 50 times um, 13, which is uh, 650. So I'm risking 100 bucks to make 650. That's not bad. But obviously, if I make 500 and we get out, made 100 already. 125. Because what's my premise? My premise is that there's nothing really here. So why should we be rallying if you're going to have a Fed statement that says nothing? So that was my premise when we were just talking about it. And now I read the statement, or I, or I let Bloomberg read it for me. And there's nothing there. There's no surprise here. And if there's no surprise, then what's the rally about? All right, so now we're up 250. Now at 250, I want to protect my money, right? I don't want to lose 250, so I'm going to be a little bit more cautious here to make sure we make we lock in at least a couple hundred bucks. Because don't forget, I, I risk losing 100 bucks. Right? If I make 100 bucks, I shouldn't risk that. That's looking good, though, isn't it? Uh, 2809. Come on, come on, fail, fail, fail. 225, ah, 212, oh, you bastard. You're kidding me. I'm going to take 200 off the table because I don't like the way it's moving. 187, I probably should take that. Should be. Now, oh, 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 no, don't like it. See how it went 118.42? I didn't like that. Now it's 110.1, though. So, so 175. So we made 175 in, in five minutes. That's okay. <clears throat> now, if this breaks down below where it was, below 210, I might get interested again. But maybe I'll look to see who's lagging behind. Meanwhile, this guy's not making money. He's not making money. But we said they might go lower, so we'll see what happens. And why is that? Is that because the dollar is moving higher? Let's see. Now, the dollar is not really punching up much. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it spiked up a little. Maybe that's what pushed them down to there. And then that spooks people. Don't forget, oil closes at 235. So the NYMEX trading stuff. So here's our best chance we can. Uh, where's the. Uh, where's, oh, our entry is only right here. It's not worth doubling down on or doing anything. Wait. If my entry is 1924, why do you say I lost 80 bucks? I don't understand that. Oh, because this is 230. This is not my buy line. Oh, look at that. Way up there. Okay. I thought that was my buy line. I'm like, why would I have lost that much money? All right. Anyway, so there's not, not enough reason to double down and do anything. I mean, like I said, the 192 line, it would have been nice to catch that, but we didn't catch it. We didn't catch this. So just leave it alone and see what happens. And uh, we got the NASDAQ here. Really, I think it's more important to watch the S&P, though. Yes, and see what it does. See, back to 213. Isn't that where we came in, right? So let's see which way it goes here. 1375. All right, well. Now, since we're not sure, we go back to the news and see how it was interpreted, or if anything was specially interpreted. Um, Union bank shares, sports gaming, Harvest Medicine, Spirit Airlines, Eurozone inflation confirmed to 2.1. Now, see, that makes the Europeans more likely to tighten because they don't want to be at 2%. They don't want to be, they really hate inflation because they, because the experience they had that led up to World War One with hyperinflation in Germany and stuff like that. They, they think that, in their mind, 2% is like, you know, inflation leads to war. That's the way the ECB sees it. So they really don't like inflation. So 
basically they're gonna they're they're more likely to tighten out. They're more likely to tighten that should knock the dollar down, which should also be bullish for stocks, which means I like my oil long and my gasoline long more than I like my short on the indexes. But we just hit 215 again. Ow, oh, come on, I missed it. I still want to take one more poke at 215. Yep. All right. Let's see what happens. I'll take one more shot at the same place we went in before. But like I said, the, the gist of that is that that should make the euro go up, which should make the dollar go down, which will be good for oil and good for gasoline. So I have more faith in these trades than I do in this one because the weak dollar is also good for the index. So even though I don't think there's anything bullish for the indexes, I do think that the ECB information is good for is weaker for the dollar. You see, that's what you got to do. You got to pay attention to all these different factors and think about how everything affects everything else. Because they do. You pull on one string and it moves everything around. Um, Caesars, <laughs> Caesars was bankrupt once, or was just about bankrupt. And they're they're doing great. Um, I used to bang my table. I used to bang the table on them too. I was like, it's freaking Caesars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like they, they go bankrupt the way Trump goes bankrupt. They come out stronger the next day. They only go bankrupt to wipe out their debts. Berkshire Hathaway looks cheap. JP Morgan says, well, there's a good way to boost the indexes, right? Tell, tell them by tell them by Berkshire. Da, 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 da. Earnings boost the semis, pulls down services. How's Micron doing? We just added a Micron. That's like one of my most recent pickups. Oh, that's what I wanted to talk about. All right, well, hang on. Forgot about that. Micron is <laughs> not doing anything. It's terrible. All right. Anyway, all right. So that's all the that's all the news since I let since we looked before the thing. I thought I said passing out. <laughs> VPs, VP manufacturers. Boy, things are going so good over there, aren't they? <laughs> the VP of manufacturing got out of the company. Wow, there's, there's something horrifyingly bad going on in that company. Canadian manufacturing sales fall, that they fell, but less than expected, so we should be happy about that. Um, mm -hmm. Wait, Tillman for Tanner, oh, this guy? Oh, I like him. Uh, 13 cash to acquire Caesars. Wow, dude, that's a lot of cash. What? What? Seven billion dollars in cash? Wow, and it's more than that because he's offering 13? They got to take it. Ooh, we can do some arbitration on that one. Where was that? News, 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 news. There. What? You're crazy. I mean, they started the day at Nine, he offered 13, he's offering a 50% premium. Wow, and the stock isn't responding. He's, he owns Fratelli, he owns all these restaurants and things, and he's a guy, he's a casino guy, he owns the Golden Nugget. Uh, he's definitely got the money. He's got, he's got the money and he's got the guys who have the money. Uh, he's a good operator. I, I can't imagine why you would want to pay this much, but if you look at it, look at the PE of Caesars, 3.64. He's not really crazy. Um, Five billion revenues, no, no income. I don't know where they get that PE from. I guess this year they're projecting income. Um, nope, I don't know where they're getting, the see how that PE is very misleading. I don't know where they're getting that from. Um, still, Good revenues, very solid numbers. He had five billion last year. Look at them now; they're, they're moving towards six billion here. The revenues are up. Things are good. They've got fantastic property as well. As I see, they have the best properties. All fantastic properties all over the place. Um, and and people love it. It's a great brand name. Uh, I am surprised though, because if I were him, I would have certainly bought up the empty properties in Atlantic City first. Instead of buying Caesars in Atlantic City too, instead of buying Caesars Palace in Atlantic City, 
I would have bought the hotels around Caesars Palace for pennies on the dollar, which are, you know, Trump's old properties are bankrupt on both sides of Caesars. Um, but nonetheless, that's a, it's not a bad move because he's buying a lot of business. So that's interesting. Oh. All right, then step two, as far as looking up stuff is the Wall Street Journal and see what they have to say about the market and so on and so forth. But Saudi's Turks far over missing writer. Okay, really? I thought that Saudis were going to admit what they did. This is so. I, I guess they kind of. I guess. I guess they floated that yesterday. They floated like, well, we killed him, but it was an accident. I think they tried that yesterday, and you know, it became. It wasn't officially announced, so it was like a rumor, and um, and, and that got a lot of name. That surprisingly, people thought that was bad, <laughs> and so now they're now they're back to denying, which is really funny. Because we, everyone knows they did it. Um, yeah, they got pictures of the guy walking into the embassy and no pictures of him walking out except in pieces. It's being carried out in bags. Um, you really messed up. Uh, Fed minutes point to continue gradual interest rate increases. Okay, well that, so, so duh, we knew this. Um, uh, Sounds back proposal to remove Zuckerberg. Oh, interesting. Um, Eddie Lampert, star who's been on series, unre he's unrepentant. Of course, he's unrepentant. He's making money. Um, he doesn't care. He never. He was never going to save Sears. All right. Okay, nothing. So there's nothing going on. That brings us back to, in that case, our short S&Ps are probably a good move. Oh, look, more money. Great. Wow, 400 bucks now. Oh, but uh, oil's down. That's good. All right, well, are we, if I add, okay, I have 86. If I add here, what does it really do? It doesn't do anything for me, but 63 was low. Yeah, I'll take it. All right. It's only going to bring me down to 77, though. 78. So my average is now 69.78. Same thing for gasoline. Oh shit. <laughs> Bastards. I wasn't gonna add one, but now it took it jump back up on me. Now remember you're adding to lower the basis. So when it comes back up, you get back out, and now you just end up with the one at the lower basis. The only reason I was adding was to load. Oh, oh, wait, here we're back to where I wanted to add. Ugh, I'm being too cheap, aren't I? See, it is 24. I'm going to get, get a decent bang for my buck. I, I, I want my average to be closer to 192, though. All right, here we go. No, no, that's not doing it. Nope, 66. What was the low 63? So that's that's the next one I might want to add. But then I have to think if I added 63, what's it going to do for me? It's going to bring if it's um, 63 is 15 below, so it's going to bring these on an average down by five. So it's going to be about 73 average. So is that really worth it? Do I feel like I'm going to get my money back at 73? Yeah, maybe. I think so, because I think the only reason, see, the, the dollar's plowed back up, so I think this is all about the dollar. Oh, here we go. Although both of these guys are falling now. Let's see if we can get it. Oh, that was too easy. I don't like that. <laughs> when it fills that easily, it's a little scary. All right, how are we doing? 67. So now I got two of these and two of these. I'm not so not not really enthusiastic about adding more if I don't have to. Let's see. Sixty-three was the low. Oh, there it is. Just to see if it holds. Sixty-three was the low. Now we're below the low, so making new low. That's not good. 
So as, as we thought, the average was, six, was 73. And I'm just going to put a cell in right there. Because I definitely didn't want to have more than two. But effectively, I figure this is selling pressure into the close of the NYMEX. It closes in still 20 more minutes. So I'm, I'm inclined to ride this out and see what happens. Because as I, as I noted this morning, there's not really all that much selling pressure on oil. So this is just somebody's just getting out into the NYMEX close. That doesn't mean it's not going to turn back around and Hopefully, it's going to make some sort of a little W here. It brings us at least back to like 70 here and buck 92 here. And both of those would be uh, back into profits. So that's my hope. Otherwise, if it's just breaking down, we're in trouble. But I don't see that. I think there's going to be good. I think there should be good support. Well, he's below his, well, he's below his low support. So that's, that's an ugly chart. But I still think it's because the dollar, the dollar is going up and up. Unfortunately, that's probably isn't going to resolve while we're watching it. Oh, that's ugly. $500 down on that one. It's because it's gasoline, very expensive mover. So we're at 192. So I would love to come down to, if I want to come down to 191, well, I'm not going to come down to 191. If I want to come below 192, I need to be double this amount below 192. So it has to be uh, 1915, which is actually right here. So if I can add one here, I'll get down to 192, which is a nice spot. Uh, oh, <laughs> he who hesitates, right? <laughs> and up it goes. Wow. Oh. Well. So that that's what I'm thinking though. If I'm going to if I'm going to add more, I want to add more with a purpose of setting a goal that I think is reasonably attainable. If I can't do that, what's the point? All right, so we're just gonna let this go and do a few more things. Let's see if anybody has any questions. Da, 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 da. Okay, Naomi says, uh, I have the uh, IBM 140, 180 bull call spread with the 145 short puts. I need to roll thoughts on IBM. I like IBM, and I don't think they're that off target that I'd want to change it. I don't know what year, so tell me what year you have. Um, so if it's January, yeah, you're going to have to do something about it. But otherwise, I mean, I like IBM, and I would roll to a, a more beneficial position and give them time to turn around. Randy said, I would have thought Yogi Berra. Aha. No, he was, well, he, he was good. Yogi Berra is great, actually. But um, no, that was, I knew it was a hitter. Yeah. Anyway, I, knew, I knew it was a hitter, and I knew it wasn't Ty Cobb, because I freaking love Ty Cobb. And I, I'm pretty sure I know if anything Ty Cobb said, I think I would know it. Um, yeah, I was a weird kid. I, like, I, I thought Ty Cobb was the greatest player of all time, not Babe Ruth. But <laughs> they both are both amazing. There's plenty to be said for both. Um, and of course, Cy Young. I mean, the, people don't appreciate Cy Young. Cy Young won 500 games. Won 500 games. Okay? He pitched 800 games. <laughs> and that's still fantastic. I mean, his winning percentage is amazing if you think about it. But nobody's ever going to beat that record. People don't even pitch 500 games anymore. You can't be, you know, you can't, a pitcher who pitches 30 games in a season, that's a lot. So to win 500 games, a pitcher would have to win basically every single game he plays in his entire career. He'd have to consecutively go like 25 and 0 for 20 straight years. This is never going to happen. It's just it's basically the most unbreakable record. And I always said that because like Pete, you know, the Ty Cobb's hit record got beat by Pete Rose, who was scrub from who we really bet on, really bet on was on baseball was, was banned for life, and his record doesn't count though. They put they ridiculous. You think of what Pete Rose did. The morals we used to have back then compared to the morals we have now. It's, it's like now you can molest women to get on the Supreme Court, but you had gone for you bet on baseball back in the day and they ban you for life. Um, 
So <laughs> the four feet rose has a record that's also amazing. That, that and again, that can be beat though because there are guys who swing that much. His average wasn't better than Ty Cobb's. He just played longer than Ty Cobb. He had more endurance. Um, but what Cy Young did is not just about being good. It's about being good and being consistent and having the longevity and the endurance to do what he did. And that's to have a combination of all of those things, like Lou Gehrig's um, hitting streak also, to have the endurance to, to play in that many consecutive games. And they, oh yeah, hit, I'm sorry, but not, it, both Lou Gehrig, has, Lou Gehrig has a hitting streak record, and he also has the consecutive game record. And the, but the, the, yeah, it's the consecutive games to play 20 years without ever sitting down or being hurt and without ever taking a day off um, that's, you know, again, it's, they don't build people like that anymore. So certain records are just amazing that you look at. And then it goes, you know, certain things just can't keep going. That's where you look at the market, too. Oh, the Dow's at 121 now. Oh, yeah, look how good we're doing. 700 for the day. Very nice. A good webinar. Well, okay. <laughs> on the other hand, we're, we're losing it on, uh, on the oil. Well, that's okay. All right, I am going to add here. Oh, you. Mm. <laughs> that is a very frustrating trading futures. <laughs> All right, well, so much for that. That's not going to fill anytime soon. All right, that fill, which is not a good thing because it was, it was a low bid. So now I've got three. At what? At, now we're below 192, though. This is unfortunately not going to get resolved today. I'm going to have to sit this out. And the thing goes here, but I'll take another one sixty nine fifty. I mean, some points going to pop back. So now our average is sixty nine sixty seven, and and basically we're just going to have to hope it pops back up into the weekend. But I, again, I think it's based on the dollar strength, and I think once the dollar calms down, these guys are going to turn around. These, especially gasoline. There's nothing really bearish about the gasoline report. You know, it's just kind of selling off with the market at the moment. That'll come back. It's the same same thing we did early in the week. We took a we took a hit and then it came back. It came back in a big way yesterday. So you just gotta wait. Oh, we have the twenty eight hundred line. It's probably a good place to take a profit on this one. Cause it's probably gonna bounce. Yeah, we'll take it. Eight fifty. And especially now, especially locking in eight fifty means I'm okay here. And it's, it's cut half the losses on the oil, so it's easy to ride out the oil and gasoline if I got half the money made up on the index. You know, if, you, if you're down on two and you're up on one, money you lock in your gain. Oh, look what happened. Wow. That was fast. That came back really hard. Ah, look at this. Okay, now here's another thing. I've lowered my average to 67, right? We're close, but we're not there yet. That's no reason not to take the freaking money. So if this thing in any way hesitates now, I want to get back to two. I, I mean, we just we just picked up seven hundred dollars. So the next the next move is, is see the next move is against me. I'm out. So one and two. So now I'm back to two. All right, because. <clears throat> Yes, I went in to lower my basis so I could get back out even. But I don't have to get it back exactly even. I'm happy enough to just have a slightly lower basis than I started with before I doubled down. I don't need to make, you know, so, you know, you realize that. If you get in here, you know, if you double down and it goes up 10 cents, then you've lowered your basis by 5 cents. You didn't get the whole 10 cents back, but you get, but if, you know, if you, if you get, you know, whatever you needed back, you didn't get it all back, but you, you made a five cent improvement. Maybe a lady will make another five cent improvement. You keep making five cent improvements until you get it back. We don't look at give horse like that in the mouth. We were down 800 bucks a minute ago. Now we're, now we're even. Now we're up 220. That's a thousand dollar turnaround while we're, while we're wondering what we should do. And look, now he's down to 441. So now all of a sudden, there's an eight here and one and one sixty there and whatever it's now it's up for the day. So now if I shut the whole thing down, it's a big profit. But I but I believe that the gasoline move was was like I said, I think it was somebody selling off into the IMX clothes. I up oh, there we go, we're profitable again. 
So clearly, I want to get out of one of these. Now I'm back to the two that I wanted long. I really wanted one long. I wasn't that enthusiastic about it before, but I'm getting a little more excited now because I got a nice low basis. Oh, look at this. Wow. I am so pleased. All right, cool. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm taking that and I'm taking that. Ugh. See, ah, oh, shit. Cause it, it, uh, there you go, see. Mm. I was gonna say, there's no reason to be greedy. Oh, there it goes, okay. Happy. All right, so now we're up. 850 plus 330 plus uh I don't know for the day 850 plus 450 is 9 13 40 yeah it was about 1500 bucks is this a great webinar or what <laughs> I think come on so that's how you make 1500 bucks while you're hanging out talking about sauce um anyway point being there's no reason to be greedy still making money Okay, I, it's the point was I went against me. I thought I looked at the news. I keep thinking about what I'm in for and what's happening. I looked at the time and the IMAX sale. Like I said, there's a lot of factors here, right? And my gut feeling on the thing was I should stick with it and we're probably gonna make some kind of recovery. But once you make the recovery, you can't let yourself get all greedy and say, oh, now I've got all these longs, I wanna stick with it. You have gotta get back to a comfortable level. All right, I was only looking to make a quick play on this and, and, and hopefully pick up a few hundred bucks and now we're in for 1500 bucks. I really would like to lock in a $1,500 gain. So any sign of weakness here is it. Is it. So here, 79, That's I don't like that. I don't like 78 even more. 79, if we can't get back over 80 soon, it's a dead trade, 77, really? Ah, so dead. Don't be emotional about your things. So here we are now. Oh. <laughs> okay, and we'll get out of that. And we're done, flat. So now 850, 360 is uh, 12, 14, and yeah, just under 15. Okay, so a little less than 1500. Anyway, so now that we're recording this, Go back and watch it. It's just like anything you want to learn to do. If I'm going to teach you how to throw a pitch, if I'm going to teach you how to hit, you go back and you watch it, and then you watch it again, and you practice it, and you go back and watch it. But it's hard to teach, and it's hard to learn as far as what, you know, what we're doing, because a lot of it's based on a lot of, it's so many different things, it's hard to talk about them all at once. So I know it comes across a little scattery, but that's why it helps to review some of these things sometimes. Um, and that's why I do a lot of reviewing and all the stuff I do, because it's important to go back and remember, why was I doing that? Because that way next time, you know, in other words, by practicing, I remember last time we had a report and we had the thing and we have the Fed. I remember what happened. I remember that we should stick with this because if it goes against you, it's probably this. And then you do that. That's all. Any, anything you get good at is like that, right? If you're in chess, the guy moves his rook forward this much, and then you say, oh, well, he's trying to do this, and then I've seen that before, and then I can do this. The more practice you have, the better you get at countering and making moves. And that's what this is. It's not a roulette wheel. You're moving. You're actively trading these things. You're getting in and out. You're changing your positions. You're changing and adjusting. And if you learn to do that, you're going to get massive control on this thing. And you're going to be able to hit them where they need. And that's what we're doing. We're investing where they ain't. We're investing where other people are not looking. But you've got to be able to find those spots. Now, JC says uh, the January 11, 14 SCO spread. I don't know what SCO is right now. Um, I mean, the real question is, do we think oil is going to get stronger into January is, is the real question there. So SCO is at 14. Do I think oil is going to be stronger into January? Eh, not really. I mean, it depends on what the profit is. If your profit is, look, if you went into the spread with two dollars, I'm sorry, it's a dollar, it's a, it's a three dollar spread. If you went into the spread with a dollar fifty and you were hoping to make a dollar fifty, that's a hundred percent, right? So let's say now you're at um, two twenty-five. Okay, 
So you've made 75 cents, you've made 50%, but now you're risking 225 to make 75 cents. So now you're gonna make 20, 30, 25% or whatever it is. You know, so now you're gonna make 25%. It's not a sure thing because you can get burned, you can lose the whole amount. So in other words, when you started the trade, your risk reward was even, right? You could lose about 50 or make about 50. But now you can lose 225 and you can only make 75 cents. Do we feel super strongly about it? No, because of the thing with the uh, Saudis could blow up. We've got, we've got Iran, which Trump just today is, is moving harder on Iran. Uh, the Saudi thing can turn into a huge incident where Saudi says, screw you, we're cutting off your oil. And that can spike up prices. So there are ways to get blown out of the position. All right. Will I close SEO in the um, short-term portfolio? Or long, I, I, I don't know. I'll tell you what, if it's in the options opportunity portfolio, I'd be inclined to close it because it's only a $100,000 portfolio and it's not worth the risk. In the short-term portfolio, it's a hedge against a downturn in the market. So I would keep it because that's the purpose of the short-term portfolio. Long-term portfolio, again, not worth the risk, but it wouldn't be in the long-term portfolio because it's just freaking SEO, it's too silly. So it depends on what you're using it for, what the purpose is, but from a straight out, is this position good now? I would say probably I would take the money because it's not worth the risk. There's no, there's no way you could say you're 75% certain or 80% certain it's gonna keep, stay where it is. That means if it's close to 50-50 on whether it goes up or down and you're risking more than you can lose, why would you take that bet? You always wanna have a positive, reward to risk ratio you should always be make if it's a 50 50 bet you should be able to make more when you win than you lose then you want to get into those kind of bets so you want to have i prefer to have at least two to one i want to be able to win twice as much as i lose so if i can win twice as much as i lose and i can be 60 to 70 percent certain that i'm going to win and if I'm right, if I'm not an idiot, and then and, you know, if I have if I have some clue about being right 70% of the time, which frankly, from our um, uh, top trade reviews, you can see that we're right 70 to 80% of the time. Um, but if I can just be 60% right, and I get paid twice as much every time I win as I lose, I really can't statistically lose. I'm going to make money. But that means logically, I should never make a bet where I don't get paid two to one and and I'm 60% certain it's gonna win. That, if I can do that and I can be right, I will end up making a lot of money. And, and but on contrary wise, discipline wise, whenever you're not sure, if you have the, you, you have to look at every trade of the brand new trade. So if from this point forward on that trade, if you're not 60% certain that you are gonna make money and if your risk and reward is not positive in your favor, it sh you shouldn't have the trade, end of trade. That's, that goes all the time, every trade. Oh, it's that guy's cousin who owns station. Yeah, but he owns a nugget, doesn't he? Um, IBM, what's your price target? And can you talk about a new entry? Um, I don't really, I don't have a price. I never have price targets. I mean, if I, if, you know, my price target is that a, a company should have a reasonable PE compared to its peers. Um, <clears throat> but IBM is tough because the earnings over time and so on and so forth. But let's take a look. EBM, let's see. I don't like this ad, no. Yes, I'm too cheap. I don't buy the English version of your thing. So annoy me every time. If you don't buy the if you don't buy the country, it blocks you out. Um, <laughs> wow, wow, seven percent. Oh, that's freaking painful. That's costing the Dow eighty points. How much is the Dow down? The Dow's down one twenty nine. That's pretty much the whole loss on the Dow is from IBM. That's painful for one day on IBM. It's probably not done going down. Um, okay. Not what it was, used to do 102 billion, now it's doing 80 billion, they shed divisions and blah, 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 right? Used to make $22 billion, wow. Now making $11 billion. But are they in decline or did they shed divisions to do a long-term turnaround? I think they shed divisions to do a long-term turnaround. So I think this is a trough and that they'll move up from here. 
That's a matter of opinion. Clearly, on the earnings estimates, though, they, they're they're moving into a very positive direction for net profit. And and an optimist would say, well, they're making 12 billion on 80 now, and they were making 16 on 102. They're they're pretty much right on track. All they got to do is bring up those revenues. If they're doing a good job somewhere, so they make 1380 a share, and the shares are now what 130, right? So their P is about 10. All right, so they, their their PE is around about 10, assuming they can do all the BS they say they can do. And uh, you know, you look at Microsoft. If you look at um, you know, it's hard to say who you compare them to, but if you look at Microsoft or anywhere like that, or Apple. Obviously, Apple, you know, the P's are in the 15 to 20 range, not in the 10 range. So, you know, it's, it seems to me that they're underpriced here. It seems to me that a fair price for them would certainly be uh, closer to 200. Certainly, I think 130 is too cheap. So, I, I consider this quite a bargain. Um, I mean, it's easy to say with a new end. I, again, I wouldn't jump into it because we have it already. We're going to be buying more. But I wouldn't run right into it because you don't know where they're going to actually bottom. There's no stopping it. If the market is crashing, which is, frankly, the only reason the market's down right now is because of IBM. But if the, if the market is crashing, um, IBM will go down further with it, whether it deserves to or not. But right now... You can sell the 2020 120 puts for uh, 12 bucks. So what we're doing is promising to buy IBM for 120. I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, and then you can take that $12 and you can buy the uh, go for the one. Let's see, these are 17 and these are 22. Would I spend five more bucks for that? Yeah, sure. I would, I would take the 120s. At 22 or let's let's say 22.50, and I would sell the 150s for 9.50. So 22.50 minus 9.50 is 13 bucks on the 30 dollars spread. So it's third now. Understand it's 13 bucks, but then you sell the 120 puts for 12.25, and you're spending a dollar for the 30 dollars spread. And the worst, so a dollar. So your worst thing that can happen to you is you're buying IBM for net 121. And again, that's 121 times 100, so it's $12,000 per short put that you're selling. But if you don't want to really buy IBM for $12,000, if that doesn't fit in your portfolio, then you shouldn't be messing around with it. But I, but I think it's a great company. I think it's something I'd be very happy to have in a portfolio. So I have no trouble at all calling that play. Short IBM puts for 12 bucks, and pick up the 120, 150 spread for 1350. So you're netting in for a dollar fifty or whatever it is. So you're netting for or it's 13, I don't know what it was, but anyways, whatever it comes out to. So it's 22.50 and 9.50, yeah, it's 13. So I'm sorry, so it's a dollar. So your net is a dollar on a $30 spread. You're gonna make three thousand percent if IBM gets back to $150 in two years. I don't know why you wouldn't want that. <laughs> Um, da, da, da. IBM Burns says, uh, why what, do you buy the 2020 to keep an option in a row? I, I don't need to know because I, I, well, look, only if I get a better price and I think it's worth it. So, first of all, you're giving up a year for your for your for IBM to improve. So, the 2020 120 150 is. Uh, six bucks and twenty bucks, so it's four. That's fourteen dollars. So first of all, you're spending more money, not much more money. You're spending one dollar more. You're spending fourteen dollars instead of thirteen dollars. And what are you getting out of it? You're getting one year less for to get to one fifty. So where is that better? Okay, the, the option to roll, if IBM goes lower, is the same anyways. The, the same that you spend $10 to roll down 20 more. So right now, the 120s are 2250 and the 100s are 3650 But So that would be $14. But the, 100, the 140s, sorry, the 140s are 11 
and 11 to 2250 is uh, 1150. So in other words, it'll be, it'll be if, if IBM does drop, it'll become cheaper to make that roll. And if that roll gets to be, you know, as a rule of thumb, I'll spend $5 to roll 10. I'll always, I'll always, I almost always spend $5 to roll 10. If I'm not willing to spend $5 to roll my calls $10 lower, then I shouldn't be in the position. That makes sense? What, what, what would I be doing in a position if I don't believe that rolling five, $10 more in the money is worth five bucks? If I don't believe that firmly, enough to put my money down, why would I be long at all? If I have the, if I have the 120 calls and I don't want to spend five bucks to put them into the 110 calls, that means I don't believe in 120. It means I don't believe in 110. So, so 134, why on earth would I be in a position to cut your losses and get out? You either believe in a position enough to put the money into it to improve it, or you don't. Don't be wishy-washy about your positions. Put your cash into something you do believe in, not into things you don't believe in. There shouldn't be any positions in your portfolio you don't believe in. Okay. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. Okay, are we done? Uh, we, oh, we're almost done. Oh, we didn't get to what I wanted to get to. Uh, go another hour. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, I will not do that. All right, anyway, all right. Very quickly, with very little explanation, let's just go back to one thing that I wanted to talk about. Very important. Top trades. As you guys know, I sent out a top trade alert on a whole bunch of stuff here. Wednesday, September 26th, when we got nervous about the market, we decided to add income and hedges for Q4. And I said, you can start a whole new portfolio with these trades. Oh, wait, I got to break it out to a new window. If I do that. Okay. And now I do this, and now I make that smaller. Hope you guys can see all this stuff. All right. And now I put that here. And is this a long-term portfolio? It is not. Meanwhile, by the way, okay, options opportunity portfolio, 57%, short-term portfolio, 172%. You know, they're holding up very well. Long-term portfolio, this is magic. Long-term portfolio, 95.4%, which is crazy. We've made a huge amount of money on this downturn. Why? And this is what's important for today. Why? Because of what we did here. Because we added nine trades that we're supposed to make $100,000 if the market was down to flat. In the LTP, we have BBY, we already had it, and I said, let's sell 20 BBY January 20s. That'd be us and beyond. Um, uh, da, 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 here they are, uh, January 20 call, sold them for $1.50. They're now 21 cents, we're up 2,500 bucks on that one. Cake. I'm not going to get into it heavy because we were almost out of time, but let's let's look. Here's cake. We added this whole position, and it is now flattish. I call that flat. All right, so that's, that's a null. But, okay, no, not really, though. The point is the overall position is flat, but the short calls, these are what matters. These short calls, the January 55 short short calls, we sold them for three. They're already above 65. They're up thirteen fifty. We're going to make all the money unless unless there's an amazing comeback. We're going to make all the money. That was our goal. The, the the longer position, I don't care if it's down a little bit now. I I believe in it. That was the point of all these. I spent by the way, I spent two weeks, two weeks. I spent the last two weeks of September looking at these things we were talking about, and I kept I kept saying I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I kept like looking and looking and looking. My goal was to find positions that we would like for the long term, 
but the short term, I felt that they had a, a very high price for their short term calls. So we could sell the calls of January. It was all about January. I wanted to get it fine. So my goal is to find positions that were not that expensive to pick up for the long term, not that volatile in the long term, but would give us cash between now and January to offset any potential losses in the long term portfolio. So in other words, I'm willing to work on all these long positions. I like cake long term. I like these things long term. What I wanted to do is pick up the short term cash. That was the key to all these trades. So the, as far as generating short-term cash, these things are phenomenal. The Pulte, holy shit. Um, <laughs> I didn't add to this. I just, I just pointed out at the time, we have these, um, I said it's a new position. I love this. We have the 2020 spread, and we have the 460 short calls. And we had originally sold them for 60. They were still 37.30 for $74,000 at the time. And those things are now $36,000. So they've made $38,000. Those, that, that's, that's what basically saves the long-term portfolio. $38,000 gain from the 26th of September until now, which is just a couple of weeks, because Chipotle went lower. And what's that long position? That long position is only, that long position is really only there to cover. Notice we're down 45 and up 29. So we're down about um, 15, 16,000 on the longs. That's nothing compared to this money we're picking up. We sold $123,000 and we lost 15,000 on the longs. That's freaking amazing. And that was all a protected position from the long so We talked about this last week or the week before. Um, this is how you make your adjustments into uncertain periods. Now, the question is, and the question I have to answer in the next two days, what are we going to do with this thing now? Do I want to risk this going back? But it has to come all the way back to 460 for us to lose. And we could still make 30 some thousand dollars. It's, it's hard. It's, it's hard to say. But if the market is coming back, I don't think I want to risk it. But if the market, I, it, I still think 460 is too much and we can still roll it. But we're up so much, it's it's like painful to stay in it. I don't know. That's tough. All right. Anyway, oh, I got it. I had to think about that. It's a lot of money. Um, GCI. So remember, wh why did I take these plays? I think over the long term, this is Gannett. I think it's Gannett. Yeah, Gannett. Um, I think over the long run, they're going to do fine. They'll be okay. So we take the, the spread, the 10, 1250 spread, but the real reason we took the spread is to sell the calls. Uh, at least calls, sorry, sell least calls for, for 75. That's nothing, so I'm sure it's up. Uh, GCI, blah, 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 blah. So look, the net of the spread is actually about even, but the, the key is I've got these short calls over 525, and we get to do this over and over and over again and keep making money. We're, we took a $1,500 total credit on the spread, and we're adding a little bit of money here. We're making 525. This negative, we're net negative, so it's still a good trade to enter as a new trade. So we're net negative, but the point of this is we have eight more quarters to sell. You know, we're just gonna keep selling like that. Here's Gilead, same kind of thing. Gilead, we took 65.80 spread, and which is well in the money. So long term, I'm very positive on Gilead. In fact, you can tell how positive I am based on whether I sell puts and if I sell puts, how many puts I sell and how in the money we go on the spread. The more in the money on the spread, the more bullish I am. The more puts we sell, the more bullish I am. Um, the less covers we sell, the more bullish I am. <laughs> so, so a lot of factors, you can, you can kind of figure out how bullish I am by that. Now this one's, this one's actually not doing well. Why is it not doing well? Because I guess Gilead's going up, right? No, not really. It's kind of, oh yeah, it is. It's, it's, up, it's up from where it was. So we're not winning on this one, but we sold the 7750 calls and they're at 75. So we're still going to collect that money. It's just that the, the calls so far haven't lost any value. They've only lost $400 in value. And that's an unfortunate option. That's one thing though, because uh, the, the 65 calls have lost value. The, and, and, and it's weird though, how can they both go against this? How can the short calls go against this and the long calls go against this? But that's what it's showing now. 
And, and some of that is just a bad bid ask right in your, in your broker account and all that. It's like, you know, you get the worst of the bid and ask in each case. So um, it, it looks worse than it is a lot of the times. So the question you always have to focus on, am I on track, am I not on track? And in this case, our goal is 80 and we're at 75. We only have to get to there to make all the money we expect to make on a $37,500 spread that we paid five fifty for. And that's only the first sale. We're gonna get to make many more sales. That's why I love that play. That play. Um, here's GoPro, doo, 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 doo. and GoPro is a huge net winner because GoPro, GoPro went flying up from where, well, GoPro went all over the place. It went up, it went down, back, <laughs> but it's net up, but it's made a surprising amount of money. Most, mostly, um, mostly the puts, the puts seem to lose a lot of value, yeah. See, then when you make so much money, when you make that much money that quickly, it's a thing she's, geez, is that too much? Did I, are they undervaluing the puts now? And should I maybe take it off the table? It's a little soon, but, you know, that's, that's kind of crazy how fast those puts dropped in price. And that's what gave us an outsized gain there. I wouldn't expect that. I respect, I, you know, if that was 500, I wouldn't think twice about it. But two and a half thousand dollars is a lot of money to make that quickly. It's kind of silly considering the, it only moved about, well, we went in here. And it only moved up to here. So that doesn't seem like it really makes any sense. Um, here's Macy's. Macy's has gotten worse since we answered it. So let's see how they're doing. Here's Macy's. See, but look, it's, it's actually not so bad. It's 18 there and 20 something there. So it's down about a thousand bucks or a little bit, 1500 bucks. Um, but the key, again, sell 35 calls for 270. The 35 calls. We sold them for $3,000 and they're up 50% already. And we're gonna sell these eight more times. That's when the money's gonna be made. It doesn't matter what happens to it. It, does, it matters in that it has to still be in a position that we feel comfortable for a cover, but we've got the 30, 40 spread. As long as it's over 25, we can still sell calls and not be worried about it blowing us out. And as long as we can still sell calls for two and a half thousand dollars a quarter, that's eight times two and a half thousand is twenty thousand dollars. We have a net 1950 credit on the spread. And we're gonna collect twenty thousand dollars just selling freaking calls on a quarterly basis, and then the spread could, could potentially pay us another fifteen thousand bucks. And that's what this is all about. It's just, it's not about making, you don't have to make the money on every single position. You have to have a plan that's going to make you money. It's like renting an apartment. You don't get all the money back that you paid for the apartment the first month you rent it out. Your plan is to keep renting it out and get your money back. You got to think of your stock positions the same way. You keep renting them out and get your money back. You keep yourself in a position where you can be a landlord and collect rents and collect premiums. Um, PSA was a straight up bet. I don't know if that's doing any good or not. That's in the put, that would be up on the put section. PSA, PSA. Nope, down 175. So still good. Target, target's down, which obviously would be good for us, I think. And then we go back to target. Jeez, where is Target? Oh, way down there. Oh, Target's doing okay. So Target's pushing uh, fifteen hundred bucks. But again, what do I really care about? The eighty-five calls that we sold for sixty-two hundred, sixty-three hundred dollars over here, those are going to be a home run. We're we're right below it, but I, I'm I'm pretty see now here. I'm pretty confident. I don't think they're going to be popping back up. But again, we made fifty percent of our money. So depending on when their earnings are, we're going to have to consider that also. THC, one of our great stocks from last year that made us so much money. Um, we sold the 28 calls for $3. And uh, that was, where are they? 28 calls, we got 310. They're up 20%, 700 bucks. The 28 calls up here. But notice we, we was a, um, it, was, it was a reasonable call. Yeah, I think it was a good price. We thought it was going to drop. It's holding up though, so I'm a little bit worried. But I think it's going to trend down a little bit from here. But you see, it, it, it adds up a few, a couple thousand here, a couple thousand there, a couple thousand there, and then we got a big hit on Chipotle for $30,000. That's why the long-term portfolio is actually higher now than it was before the sell-off. 
You know, we made some very good plays, but the plays are, <clears throat> the plays were to establish a long-term position in stocks where we thought they had overpriced short calls, short-term calls. We were looking to stocks that had expensive January calls compared to a reasonable 2021 entry. So we're being bullish long-term at the same time as we're being bearish on the short-term. And a lot of these trades, obviously, if they really go down, we're going to be very happy to adjust and add to them and roll them and so on and so forth. That's how we build our long-term position. But we build it on the backs of the gains that we make from the short-term calls that we sell. And what are we doing? We're being the house. We're playing the game. We open our casino. We invite people to bet against us. We're saying, hey, we like these guys for the long term, but you know what? For the next three months, we think not. Now, don't forget, that's what I was thinking back in September when the market was still super high. Now, it's a little different because we had a sell-off. It wasn't as steep as I thought it was going to be, and maybe we're making support. We're going to watch our bounce lines and see how things go. And today the index is ending up flat after uh, much chagrin, but flat is good though. Flat is actually after yesterday's performance, flat is good. So technically this is a building day. There's nothing wrong with today's action. But that's how we save the portfolio. And so, so amazingly, the short-term portfolio, so we're in again one of those positions where the short-term portfolio made a lot of money and gained, and long-term, with this almost a million dollars already, the long-term portfolio by itself. So we're in really good shape here as far as portfolios and the balance. And like I said, the options opportunity portfolio held up extremely well. And the butterfly portfolio is 37%, I'd say. Oh, 36.6. <laughs> it, never, it never changes. And the money tour portfolio is 93%. Ah, oh, that's so great. Well, next Wednesday, I'm on the show. So next Wednesday, we're gonna make changes to the money tour portfolio too. So very exciting, but we, we came through this dip extremely, extremely well and in incredible shape. And uh, now we're gonna make our adjustments over the next two days. I have a lot of work to do. So I will be talking to you guys in the chat room. Uh, let's see, ba, 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 ba. and everybody's good. No other questions. Well, that's it. We're gonna pull right at three o'clock on the dot. Have to exit here, perfect ending. Have a good week. Talk to you guys in the chat. Take care.